Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I've got a couple of um, announcements for you, and then uh, we can go into um, material. Um, the key for the problem set that was due on Monday is posted on Moodle, so you'll be able to see that, um, and I will get uh, graded versions back to you uh, by Friday, um, but if you want to look at the key for your studying right now, it's already up. Um, remember that you have the full cytometry problem set due on Friday. Um, also, by class time on Friday, please um, respond to the doodle poll that I sent you. Um, so that we can figure out a time for a review session. Um, sorry that Sunday is not an option. That's actually the day that we're taking our DSEM students to New York City, so I'm otherwise occupied by herding 20 students around New York City um, on Sunday. Um, but there are some cho other choices there. Um, so remember that and sort of your prep for the exam. Um, some others, I, I never remember stuff like this, but it's on my mind, so I'll actually say it this time. Um, I know that we've got a couple of uh, new transfer students. Um, the president of Drew is having a meet and greet for all new first year and transfer students um, tomorrow from 4.30 to 6 at her house, which is on campus, um, where there will be donuts and lawn games and things. Um, so if you would like to go to the president's house and get free donuts and lawn games, it is open to um, new transfer or first year students. And for everyone else, there's also a tomorrow from 4.30 at 4.30, a faculty dessert night from the biology department where the biology faculty are making desserts um, and uh, mingling with students. And so you could go to two different events and get desserts, um, which I'm sure will be very helpful for your studying. Um, I feel like there was something else that I was going to say, and I don't remember what it is. So if I think of it, I'll tell you. Um, but today we're going to continue um, thinking about B cell development and selection. Um, so just to remind you, we are in the yellow organ um, here. And we are thinking about the yellow parts of our B cells life. Um, we are not yet in pink organs thinking about pink steps. Um, we first saw pro B cells last time. This table is dividing up pro B cells into a couple of different steps. I um, really just called them pro B cells um, for you. Um, Really, the first step is where the pro B cell is doing D to J of the heavy chain and then V to DJ. So eventually we're getting um, V to DJ of the heavy chain. So we're making heavy chain in a pro B cell. Um, thus, the pro B cell has nothing, no membrane receptor on its surface because it hasn't made it yet. Um, it will have RAG1 and RAG2 on because it needs to have RAG1 and RAG2 in order to do that VDJ recombination. And once the cell um, finishes making that heavy chain, that heavy chain will be transcribed and translated and will go onto the surface of the cell, um, making that cell now um, a pre-B cell. We haven't made the light chain yet, so that light chain, the heavy chain will be paired with the surrogate light chain, um, making a pre-B cell receptor instead of being paired with a regular light chain, making the B cell receptor. Um, so you can see we have um, heavy chain made, we've got the pre-B cell receptor, and we turned off Reg1 and Reg2 so that the cell could proliferate. We got some survival signals, we did some allolic exclusion. Um, and then once the cell has sort of gotten those good signals, it will also stop making surrogate light chain, um, and it will turn on Reg1 and Reg2 to start doing its light chain rearrangement. Um, and so we were in this pre-B cell uh, when we ended off last time. Um, I've drawn some different stages of B cell development on the board here. Um, I will say that I would imagine in uh, the plots that I have drawn 
that I somehow sorted, perhaps using my fluorescence activated cell sorter or my fax machine, um, I sorted cell populations um, in these. And so if you look at the plot that I've drawn on the far left, what cell population do I have there? We can like label it and stuff. What cell population do I have here? Yeah, Grace. So the, these are pro B cells. And how do you know these are pro B cells, Grace? Right. So heavy chain is mu and it's negative. Light chain is kappa, it's negative. Um, what are here in the second? Yeah, Emma. So these are pre-B cells. We have a heavy chain. We don't have a light chain. Um, so you can notice that. Um, one thing to be aware of is that one way that it's I can sort of like, like sometimes students will have things be super memorized and be like going on an exam and not thinking. And sometimes if I just put the labels in a different order, um, it throws, up, throws you off completely. So read the labels. And of what I'm asking, like if I ask for pre first and then pro, don't just like, well, the first one isn't here and the second one is here. Like actually think about what the label said. It's one of those tricks I can do that um, makes things pretty easy. I've also got one other plot that I filled in, which is all the way on the right. Um, I've asked versions of this plot before on an exam and people have been baffled. So I thought I would draw it and ask you about it now. So what is that plot that's on the far right? What kind of cells are those? Yeah, Andrew. So Andrew thinks it's going to be an immature B cell. Why do you think that, Andrew? OK. OK, so it has heavy chain because it's positive for mu. Is that plot identical to the other four? Is there, or is there anything different about that one on the right versus the other four? Yeah, the axis is different on that one, isn't it? So what's the thing on the, the y-axis on that one? Like I said, I've asked this before, and it's like blown people's mind. It's really not that tricky. What's, what's that thing on the y-axis? Yeah. So there's a lambda, but what's next to the lambda? Five. Lambda five. You heard we heard of lambda five at all? Yeah, Grace. The lambda five is one of the parts of the surrogate light chain. V pre B is the other part of the surrogate light chain. So what kind of cells are shown in that plot on the far right? Which ones? Pre B cells because they have surrogate light chain and heavy chain. So that's that's another way I could show pre B cell, or if I had written V pre B instead of lambda 5, that also would work. So note that here we're just really measuring like which chains are on the surface of the cell. Um, and simply by kind of switching around the axes, we can think about a lot of these different cell types. So as we see in our uh, we were just saying in our pre-B cell, the pre-B cell is starting to rearrange the light chain. It's doing V to J rearrangement of the light chain. And if it's successful, if it does it right, then the cell gets promoted to the next uh, stage. And now this cell has both a heavy chain and a light chain on its surface. So it's like a whole IgM. And now we call this cell an immature B cell, um, as Andrew pointed out before. Um, so what would, we're going to talk about what the immature B cell is going to look like. Um, we'll talk about it right now. And then I'm going to come back and actually um, complicate our drawing a little bit. So what would you, what sort of in a simple way would you think of for the immature B cell? What do you think, Emma? Hmm? So it would look like this. 
um, you have a cell population that's both positive for heavy chain, positive for light chain. Um, as I said, in reality, the answer is a little more complicated. But for what we're saying right now, we'll go with this. And usually on an exam, I would actually take this. <laughs> Though I, we are going to talk about what the real answer is that is slightly more complicated than that. Once the cell has made a heavy chain, it has successfully made that heavy chain, everything's good, we're going to turn off RAG, and we're never going to turn it on again. That cell is good. Um, and so we can have these B cells. First, you can see here are our, here are our pro B cells. They don't have anything on their surface. <laughs> here are our <laughs> pre B cells. They've got the pre B cell receptor on their surface. And here you can see the immature B cells still in the bone marrow, haven't left the bone marrow yet, but now have a full B cell receptor on their surface. Um, and so when those cells actually leave the bone marrow, then they become mature B cells. But we're still in the bone marrow. We just have a B cell receptor. Um, just like with the heavy chain, however, we do have to test the light chain. The way that the heavy chain or the light chain can go wrong is pretty much the same as what we saw with the heavy chain. And what was the problem, the biggest problem we saw with the heavy chain? Yeah, Josh? Or maybe that wasn't a hand. Maybe I just misread a gesture. Go for it. So with the heavy chain, if the first one goes wrong, mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah, the first one goes wrong, then the second one goes wrong, mm -hmm. and then if that one goes wrong, then the cell Yeah, so the cell has two tries to make a good heavy chain. What, do I, what does go wrong mean? Okay, so specifically the adding and subtracting could lead to a frame shift and we could have a truncated protein. And so the same kind of thing, we're adding and subtracting when we make the light chain too, we could have the same thing happen. The trick with the light chain is that the cell doesn't have just two chances for the light chain. Because the light chain is encoded twice. So we've got actually a kappa chain, and we have a lambda chain on a different chromosome. And so each cell, so here's our cell, these, these green cells correctly made heavy chain, either on the first try or the second try. We don't care. They, they made it either way. Good job, them. Then they're going to try one of the chromosomes with kappa. And they always try kappa first. Try one of kappas. It could be mom's kappa. It could be dad's kappa. Whoever's kappa, they're going to try first. Maybe they succeed, and then they get to be a purple cell. And maybe they fail. If they fail, then they try the other kappa. So if they had tried mom's kappa first, now they try dad's kappa. Maybe they succeed. Maybe they fail. If they fail with both kappas, then they actually try the lambdas. So a different light chain locus on a different chromosome. So they try lambda, and maybe lambda works or maybe they fail, and then they try again, maybe lambda works, maybe they fail. So we get four tries with the light chain to actually make this work. And only after the light chain has um, failed four times will the cell actually die. Again, we're looking to get a signal through the receptor. And when we get the signal through the receptor, we're going to have a lelic exclusion at the light chain. So basically, that's another way of saying, we turn off RAG and stop this recombination business. We have cell proliferation. We have survival. I don't have those in the right order because, of course, you survive. Then you turn off the RAG. Then you proliferate. But I don't care that you really know that. It's just that I know that. Um, and so these are sort of the, the general steps. Yep, Andrew. Because that's how the 
number of genes evolved on the chromosome. That's just how many we got. <laughs> so in reality, like I said, the immature B cells look a little bit different. Some of them succeeded when they tried the kappa chain. And so they have mu and kappa on their surface. But some of them failed when they used their kappa chain. And so what do they have on their surface? They could be, they're an immature B cell. They totally did a good job of being an immature B cell, but what's on their surface? Yeah, so they have mu and lambda. So where would the ones that have mu and lambda show up on this plot? Yeah, so they'd be in the bottom right. So they've got mu. They don't have kappa. And we're not measuring lambda in this plot. If we did a different experiment and measured lambda, then they'd be up there. But we're not doing that here. Um, and so th that really is what the immature B cells would look like. Um, I will also note that this is kind of showing what would have happened if we sorted the cells. If we just take bone marrow, bone marrow will look like this. <laughs> Because bone marrow will have a mixture of pro B cells, free B cells, lambda using immature B cells, and kappa using immature B cells. <laughs> and so that's what it would actually look like if we didn't sort, because we have all of them in that mixed together in the bone marrow. Um, so this is kind of, again, the, gen the same overview that you just saw on that previous slide. This is just your textbook's version. So first we do D to J of the heavy chain. Then one chromosome will finish B to DJ of the heavy chain. Try to put that on in the surface. If it works, woohoo, we're a pre-B cell now, and we can start trying the light chain. If it fails, we try again on the second chromosome, either successful or fail. And then here you can see, here are the four chances for the light chain. You could either end up making kappa, which is shown in green, or lambda, which is shown in orange. And if you fail all those times, then the cell dies. So what you should notice here is that if you're going to get 5 million B cells a day finishing this process, you had to start with a lot more than that because there are going to be so many that are going to end up dying. And I still haven't even told you all the reasons for the dying yet. So we still have one other thing. Um, and again, um, when that sort of immature B cell is done, RAG is going to turn off. And RAG is off now for the life of the B cell. We're done with RAG. No more RAG in its life. So at this point, we have these cells with a functional B cell receptor. We have our immature B cells. But those immature B cells are still in the bone marrow. There's actually one more thing that has to happen before we let them leave the bone marrow. And this sort of gets us into it, it, it shows some stuff that I've oversimplified or just skipped over <laughs> uh, with some past things, but that is a really important aspect of the immune system. Um, one other thing I'll just tell you is that um, one thing that we also think about at this point is often uh, some aspects of class switching. On this figure, you can see all of my constant region genes as well as my V, D, and J genes. Um, and I like this image of chromosome 14 because it lists the length of DNA sequence between each of the constant region genes. And so what you should notice is that mu is pretty close to VD and J. It's relatively close, 6.5 kb. D is also pretty close. But then it's a really long way until you get to the G or the gamma. And more long distances for all of the other ones. So let's imagine that you are RNA polymerase. 
you are going to do some transcribing from this DNA. You, so let's say that our V, D, and J have been joined together. So you're ready. You're going to transcribe. You're like, I'm going to make some V, D, J's RNA. How do you feel about making some mu RNA? Seems fine. Like, seems like not a big ask. How about D or delta? See, it, it, it seems okay. How about G? How do you feel about G? You would have to read 55 kilobases of nothing before you got to G. How would you feel about reading 55 kilobases of nothing? Not good. How would you feel about reading 55 kilobases without getting distracted, even if it was not nothing? That's way too long. I'm tired already. No, that's too tiring. And so what tends to happen is that the RNA polymerase will be able to transcribe mu and delta, and they won't, and won't be able to transcribe much further than that. Um, and in fact, this cell can make both IgM and IgD from the same RNA because that RNA usually has the M or the VDJ, the M and the D, and will splice to either make IgM or IgD. And so we'll get different splice forms to get IgM and IgD. Um, the other isotypes, the ones that are far away, they got their whole, whole own other process. <laughs> Because they're a long ways away, and that's too tiring to go that far. Um, also note that when we have that transcript, there are different places where we can polyadenylate the transcript to either allow the B cell to make the secreted antibody, so basically not put a transmembrane domain and end the protein here, or put a transmembrane domain and get the B cell receptor. And so this is also something that happens by taking your DNA and um, keep the same old DNA, but splice RNA transcripts. And so what that means is that you have this one piece of DNA and you could make two different RNAs off of it. And you could be making secreted protein and membrane bound protein at the same time. Because you can just have that one DNA. Similarly, you could make IgM and IgD at the same time. Because you're doing this as a, as a RNA splicing thing, not as a DNA change. So note that sometimes we have IgM and IgD made at the same time due to different patterns of splicing and processing RNA. And this is a thing that the cell can like reverse and regulate and choose which one it wants to do and all that fancy business. Similarly, um, in terms of making secreted antibody versus making membrane IgG. Um, so just I'm bringing with this slide we saw earlier, but I'm bringing it back to kind of show you these parts that are happening via RNA splicing. OK, now I have to tell you the what the bitsy bitsy other little thing I kind of left out earlier that gets us into the one other thing that has to happen to our B cell before that B cell leaves the bone marrow. So I've shown you this slide previously. And I've used it to tell you about this um, theory known as the clonal selection, clonal expansion theory in immunology. And we've talked about how we generate diversity in our primary lymphoid organ, like our bone marrow. Um, and we make all of these diverse cells and then release them out into the rest of the body to look for antigen. So you can see that all happening here. And when we are doing this generation of diversity process, this VDJ recombination process, it is entirely random. You are making just so many developing B cells and so many developing T cells when we get there that mathematically you get every combination of VD and J made at least once. And you get them made with different PNN nucleotides. So basically, you get every possible B cell with every possible B cell receptor made kind of like almost every day, every couple of days. Um, and remember I told you when we talked about Landsteiner that basically you can make a B cell or make an antibody against pretty much any biological molecule there is. Like, that's pretty much how it works. 
So you're going to make one of legitimately every B cell during VDJ recombination that can have an, and one B cell, each of whom has an antibody that's different. And among those antibodies, you can bind every single biological molecule. It's pretty good defense, right? Like, no matter what that microbe throws at you, no matter what it evolves tomorrow, you already got the antibody for it because you made all of them, just all of them. SARS-CoV-3 that evolves in 2050, you already got that antibody. You got one B cell, but you're not going to be able to do much until you eventually get the infection and get this um, expansion, but you already got the one B cell today. Is there a problem that you see with this scheme as I've just drawn it or I've just explained it to you? I will hint that I have a lot of white boxes covering the real version of this, these images. Neither of these are the real image. There's, there are white boxes covering some stuff up in how I was oversimplifying before. What's the problem in what I just told you? Yeah, Grace. Okay. Okay. So we have some ways that we'll deal with that later. Um, but let's imagine the B cell. If if the antigen's there, the B cell's gonna find it. That's all fine. What were you gonna say, Andrew? Mm -hmm. So we're we're gonna coming towards something similar to that. One of the words you use there has a very specific meaning for immunologists. So. We're going to get into the, that specific meaning. You make one B cell against every biological molecule possible. Why is that a problem? Yeah? Nope, we don't care. It, we got all the ATPs we need. Don't care. Every biological molecule possible. Joel. Nope, you, you, that's fine. Yeah, Josh. Yeah, you're made of biological molecules, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which means if you actually make one of every B cell that combines to every biological molecule, that means you've made all sorts of B cells that are going to react to all the different parts of your body. It turns out that's true. You do. You make all the B cells. but before we let those B cells out of the bone marrow, we test them to figure out which ones are reactive to self. And if there's one that's reactive to self, we get rid of it. And we say, nope, you're not allowed to go out into the rest of the body. And we only allow the ones that don't respond to self out of the body. And so officially, when we talk about the clonal selection <laughs> process. The idea here is that we're selecting the useful cells and letting them leave. And the ones that would be harmful, we're saying, no, 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 we're not, we're not letting you out. So I talk about how BDJ recombination is happening in the absence of antigen. And that's true in that this, the, this developing cell is not like picking, oh, I think this V would be really good for Ebola. It's totally random. But there is going to be this testing step, not against foreign antigens, but against self antigens before we let the B cells leave the bone marrow. Um, this is something known as a central tolerance mechanism. So tolerance to an immunologist means a way that we make sure you don't have a reaction to self, a way that we avoid reactions to your own self molecules. So it's a way that we get rid of self-reactive cells. When we talk about, so tolerance is also kind of thought of as like the way you prevent autoimmunity. When I think about tolerance, I can break tolerance up into two kinds. One of the kinds is central tolerance. The other one is called peripheral tolerance. 
central tolerance means that it is a tolerance mechanism that happens in a primary lymphoid organ during development of the cells. Peripheral tolerance means it's a tolerance mechanism that happens later. So we're here only talking about central tolerance of B cells. Um, and so what you can see is that we are going to get rid of B cells that are responding to self antigens. You can see here's number one and number four. They were responding to self antigens, so we get rid of them and we don't let them out into the rest of the body. We only let numbers two and three out into the rest of the body. Uh, and that's our central tolerance mechanism. I'm going to mention one thing. This is going to be moderately interesting or useful now. It will be way more interesting and useful later in the semester, but here it makes sense. One thing that we will see with all of our tolerance mechanisms, particularly our central tolerance mechanisms, because we will also talk about central tolerance when we do T cell development, and we'll see how T cells deal with the same problem. With our central tolerance mechanisms, they all have a lot of pros, and they also all have some cons. They all have like a thing where you're like, wait a minute, that seems like a blonde's plan. And it's totally true. In fact, if you look at those central tolerance mechanisms, in a lot of ways, we're like balancing on the knife's edge of autoimmunity. Like we're right on the edge with that central tolerance mechanism. Fortunately, we have peripheral tolerance as like backup. But you can see we're like you're like mm, that's a little like broad for me. That I, I feel a little sketchy when I hear about some of these mechanisms. It's actually evolutionarily a good thing. It's actually evolutionarily better for you to have a broad response and live through infectious diseases when you're a baby, even if it means you get autoimmune disease when you're 40. And why is it better evolutionarily? You have a super broad response. You're super protected from infectious disease, which is particularly a problem for babies. And it's not evolutionary a problem if you get some autoimmune disease when you're 40. Why, why does that make sense evolutionarily? Yeah, Josh? Uh huh. You can't beat out those infections in this area. Yeah, so what's, what does evolution care about? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually when we think about evolution, it's can you survive and reproduce? If, you're, if your immune system is way too broad so that you get sick after you reproduced, evolution don't care. You survived, you reproduced, you made it through childhood, you're good. And so, yeah, we have evolved this immune system that's like, right, that's like super crazy broad. And in some cases can go wrong into autoimmunity because we're like balanced on the edge. But evolutionarily, that's fine because it kept us protected when we were young and it allowed us to survive all sorts of infectious diseases. Um, an immunologist I know once gave this presentation where he said that um, evolutionarily, um, infectious disease was a way, way, way bigger threat to any of our ancestors than saber tooth tigers which were even more than autoimmunity. And then I argued about like when were saber-toothed tigers alive, but whatever, that's fine. Um, so um, in any case, um, yeah, the central tolerance mechanisms can be a little flawed. And the one thing I will tell you with the uh, B cell central tolerance mechanism is that developing B cells only can test against antigens that are found in the bone marrow. So if you have some, say, protein that's only found in your eye, developing B cells do not get tested against it. They only get tested against things that are found in the bone marrow. But like, you know, actin <laughs> is in the bone marrow. We can test against that pretty well. But if you have something that's super tissue specific, it doesn't find its way to the bone marrow and we don't test B cells on it. Um, so this is just another way of thinking about um, what's going on with our B cell central tolerance mechanism. If we have a developing B cell and it does not react with the antigens that are present in the bone marrow, so no reaction, 
then hooray, it gets to grow up. It gets to leave the bone marrow, go to the rest of the body. And usually when that happens, it starts making IgM and IgD. And that's one of the ways we know it's sort of a, a B cell that just came out of the bone marrow. And that's why I mentioned to you how it's possible for a B cell to make IgM and IgD. If, however, that B cell reacts with a self antigen, that B cell stays in the bone marrow. And we got to do something about it. It turns out there are three things we can do about it. So in the case of B cells with central tolerance, there are three things we can do to make sure that this self-reactive B cell does not go out into the rest of the body. One option, and I was noticing on some of my previous slides that just like give you a broad overview of this, almost all of them assume that it's this option, but really there's three options. It's not always just this one, but this is the one people think about a lot. One option is if that B cell binds to self antigen in the bone marrow, it dies. It gets deleted. This particularly happens if it's a super, super, super strong binding. Like, there's nothing we're going to do to make that B cell better. We're just like, eh, dead. Um, and like I said, deletion is assumed on some of the slides I showed you earlier, but it is not the only mechanism. And um, scientists argued about how this worked for a long time. And so they ended up doing some experiments. And this experiment that I'm going to be telling you about actually showed them both of the other two mechanisms. Um, but it takes a second for me to explain to you how they did this experiment. So basically, some people were like, oh, delete the answer is deletion. Deletion happens. And other people were like, no. Deletion is not what happens. The reason why you see deletion in your experiment is because you're trying to follow the one B cell, and you just didn't find it sometimes. Like if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, which would be the one B cell specific for one antigen, sometimes it's hard to find a needle in a haystack, right? And so some people are like, no, the reason why you can't always find it isn't because it got deleted. It's just because you can't find it. And these experiments were done in the 80s when the tech was sort of tricky on that front. Now we could probably find it, but then they definitely could not. So they had to figure out a way where they could do some experiments and actually like start to test these hypotheses, but not be looking for a needle in a haystack. And so they came up with this approach. So they made two different mice. They genetically engineered two different mice. So we're going to talk about the two original genetic engineered mice, which are at the top. And then we'll talk about the one at the bottom. But first, we're going to think about these two totally separate genetically engineered mice. So in one mouse, They genetically engineered the mouse so it had a pre-rearranged heavy chain and light chain VDJ. So they made this mouse. They gave it the DNA for a heavy chain and a light chain that they knew and they liked. And they put, they put those genes in the mouse's embry mouse embryo. So when the developing B cell would go to the bone marrow and be like, I'm going to be a B cell when I grow up, it would get ready to do some rearrangement. And it would transcribe this B, D, and J that it was already made and put this, the receptor on the surface. And it would work. So then it would allelically exclude and not re rearrange anymore. And it would do the same thing for this one. And so what would end up happening in this mouse is 100% of the mouse's B cells would all have this receptor that they put in. Because these receptors would work, worked on the first try and allelically excluded out all the other ones. So 100% of the mouse's B cells all responded to the same epitope. Now, sometimes students get really worried about this mouse. And in some ways, they're totally right, and in some ways, they're totally not. If this mouse, escaped the lab and ran out into the world, this mouse would be so dead.
because it has 100% of its B cells all responding to the same one thing. So whatever random pathogens it got on the streets, it would not be able to respond to. So yeah, it would be, that would be terrible for the mouse. But it lives in the lab where we make sure that doesn't happen. And for us, it's a great source of as, like, as many B cells as we want that have this same specificity. No more needle in a haystack. Now we have like all the needles, right? And specifically, this um, antibody bound to an antigen called HEL, which stands for hen egg lysozyme. So if you had to guess, what organism does HEL come from? A chicken. In fact, it comes from a chicken. So these mice have 100% of their antibodies binding to a chicken protein. Again, if they were out in a world where there were pathogens, they would be toast. If, if they went to the chicken restaurant, maybe they'd be okay. Because they could all, all of their antibodies would go against the chicken protein. But if they're in the real world, they're in bad shape. But as far as they're concerned, HEL is just some other foreign antigen. Like, whatever. So that's one mouse they made. The other mouse they made had, another, had a new gene added to its genome. And that gene encodes hen egg lysozyme, H-E-L. Again, this is just a random chicken protein. So now you have a mouse that just makes one extra protein, and it's a chicken protein. And no one cares. The mouse runs around and does mouse things, and it's fine. So that's all good. Those two mice make sense. But then, for the experiment, what they did is they took these two mice, and they crossed them together. They made them have progeny. And so now they made this mouse where 100% of the B cells respond to an antigen that's a self-antigen. And so we're now we're not going to be trying to follow what happens to the one B cell, the needle in a haystack. We're going to be looking at like what happens to all the B cells in a mouse. And so we can see what goes on pretty easily in this mouse. Um, so these are some of the experiments. This is some of the idea of the data that they were doing. These are sort of, some of what I will show you is actually their real data from the 80s. So it's not, you know, perfectly beautiful, clean flow cytometry because some of the techniques are a little tricky, but that's okay. So here on their x-axis, they're looking at IgM. So you can basically say, is there a B cell receptor <laughs> on the surface of the B cell? Or you can, or in fact, because they're looking at um, a bulk number of cells, like a whole bunch of cells, like in the spleen, I think it was, they're basically, this is basically telling them, is my cell, is the cell a B cell? If it has IgM, it's a B cell. If it doesn't have IgM, it's not a B cell. Maybe it's a T cell. Maybe it's a neutrophil. Who knows? It's a not B cell. And on the Y axis, they're actually able to look at the specific B cell receptor that binds to HEL. So the first plot shows you a mouse from the mouse store. And in the mouse from the mouse store, there is a population of cells here that don't bind to the antigen and don't have B cell receptor on their surface. What would you call those cells? We're, 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 at, we're not in bone marrow, but if we're in bone marrow, absolutely. I would call these not B cells, something else, okay? And we've got a bunch of B cells. We don't see anything up here where we would see B cells that bind to the antigen. There might be one dot, but they couldn't see it with that thing. There might be one B cell that the mouse normally makes like this, right? But we can't see it. This is in their mouse where they put in the pre-rearranged VDJ. So this is that mouse on the right. 
the mouse has some not B cells, but all of the B cells bind the antigen. So you can see they got 100% of their B cells binding this antigen. They're all positive for binding antigen. So if the hypothesis is deletion, you think deletion's what's going to happen, what would you expect to see in the progeny mouse if, it was, if the answer was deletion? Expect deletion. What would you expect to see? Would there be any? No oh, sorry, Andrew. Would 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 the not B cells commit apoptosis? No. So we'd still have some not B cells. So are we going to be able to see them? Are they going to show up? Are they going to be present? Present is a big part of this. Are they present? Nope, not present. They died. So that's it. They're missing. That's all we got, right? That's what we would expect if the answer is deletion. Um, so this, these are the data. These are their actual data for the plots I showed you before. So this, these are really just the plots I showed you before with the actual data. Um, here, they're, on the bottom, they're actually using two markers for B cells. The top is what you were just looking at with IgM versus antigen binding. So this right here is actually what they saw in those mice where 100% of their B cells were self-reactive for this antigen. What do you see? Hmm? What's, there's nothing where. Okay, so up here, we had B cells that bound to antigen, and we don't have B cells that bind to antigen anymore. They, they are missing. What do we have? Huh? So we got some non-B cells. Anything else? So these are the non-B cells. Anything else we have? Yeah, Josh. We have B cells. But they don't have the they don't bind antigen. So we we somehow we didn't have zero B cells. They're not deleted. They're still present, but they don't bind antigen. And what they found in these experiments is that in this case, when the B cells are self-reactive, the B cells have a way to switch to a different B cell receptor. They're like, oh, this one's bad. I'm gonna try a different one. And so these B cells tried again <laughs> and made a new B cell receptor. And so they didn't die. They weren't missing. They just stopped binding the thing that they were originally going to bind. This process is known as receptor editing. So you can see that one option is, is deletion, but another option is receptor editing. And so the way that this works is our B cell will actually say, all right, fine, and turn RAG back on. RAG is never on again when we leave the bone marrow, but with, in the bone marrow, we can, if we have to turn it back on, we can. We'll turn RAG back on, and it will make a new B cell receptor. And now try again to not be self-reactive. And now if it's not self-reactive, it can leave. And so that's exciting. And so here you can see, I like this image because it actually shows one important piece of what happens of receptor editing. This is like a thing to asterisk about receptor editing. Here's our B cell receptor that we made. When our B cell receptor edits, it does not change its heavy chain. It only changes its light chain in order to try to make a new B cell receptor. And that's good enough because remember, it's the combo of the heavy and the light chain that really give you specificity. And so here you can see our original B cell. It had a black heavy chain and a black light chain. And that B cell might do receptor editing. And now, see here, this one, it has blue light chain, and this one, it has pink light chain, because it tried again to make not this self-reactive pair. Yeah? Great 
great question. So before I get to Josh's question, I want to come to another question, but they're kind of all related. Um, so actually, all right, actually, no, this slide does more Josh's question first. So we're going to do this question first. So let's imagine that our original B cell, it shows V3 and J3. We would put those two together, and we leave all those outside ones. Remember I made you draw that on your problem set, and you had to draw all the outside ones staying there? What can happen is because the outside ones are still there, they can actually rearrange and kick out that middle thing. So now, because 1 and 2 are left for the Vs and 4 is left for the Js, the B cell could use, say, 1 and 4, delete the intervening DNA, and have 2 and 4 together. So basically, any of the Vs and Js that are outside of the ones that have already been tried can be used. And so what that might also highlight to you is that sometimes you can receptor edit a lot of times. If it just so happened your first time through you use like the very middle ones, you could like do a ton. If your first time through you use the outside ones, then you're out of luck and you can't do anymore. And you can try all your kappas, all your lambdas. <laughs> so two kappas, two lambdas. So you got a lot of tries to try to get some light chain that's gonna work. Um, and so here is, again, same idea. The autoreactive B cell um, originally chose this V and J. Those didn't work. So we arranged around it to do a different V and J. We have a new light chain. Originally, it was like white, and now it's yellow. Um, and now we can test that one. Oh, the old one was bad. The new one, it's good. We'll let that cell leave. <laughs> That cell may now leave the bone marrow. It is no longer self-reactive. Um, and as I said, you can receptor edit all the kappas and all the lambdas. <laughs> so you have so many choices for receptor editing. But the other point I wanted to make is like, OK, this is amazing. We can try so many light chains, potentially. We can just try all sorts of light chains until we can get a light chain that works. What about the heavy chain? I specifically told you that receptor editing is changing the light chain, and um, it can't involve the heavy chain. So we can think about why it is that it can't involve the heavy chain. And again, I made you draw some things about this on a problem set on purpose. So here you can see a sort of overall picture of light chain rearrangement, and at the bottom you can see heavy chain rearrangement. Why is it that we cannot receptor edit at the heavy chain? Yeah, Josh. Yeah, by the time you put a V and a J onto the Ds, you have got rid of all the other Ds. So imagine, I'll just imagine, for example, that I have another D here. So I do this first D to J rearrangement. I kick out this D down here. But this D is still present, right? But then when I do this D to V, to v rearrangement, I kick out this other V. So by the time I've done the rearrangement, I've got, I might have some leftover Vs, I might have some leftover Js, but I don't have any leftover Ds. I got rid of all the Ds. Can I put a, a heavy chain V and a heavy chain J together? No, why not? Yeah. So they have the same RSS. They have the same recombination signal sequence. Like they both will have a 23. It doesn't work. You got rid of all the ones that would work. So once you made the heavy chain, you made a heavy chain. You're, you can't receptor edit your heavy chain. But the light chain, because there's only the two, and you might have some outside ones, and you also have so many loci, you can like try again and try again with the light chain to receptor edit. 
Um, so these are um, exactly those same data that I was just showing you. So here we can see we've got our non-transgenic mouse, our mouse from the mouse store. It has not B cells, and it has B cells. <laughs> and very few of them bind to the antigen of interest. Here we have not B cells and B cells, and we have a lot that bind to the antigen of interest in our um, transgenic mouse, but it's still a foreign antigen. And here's the mouse I just showed you, where we have the not B cells and we've got B cells, but they don't bind to the antigen of interest. They have receptor edited, so they cannot bind it. In this experiment, however, they actually set the experiment up two different ways. And it has to do with how they set up their hen egg lysosome. I'm going to sort of explain to you how they, like, what they did, the, like, why exactly they got receptor editing versus the other thing I'm going to show you. Like, I don't care that you, like, I'm happy to talk about and we, it sort of comes up in what I'm telling you, but like, don't stress out if you don't understand that part. Really, I want you to know there's three things and they found two of them in this experiment. Um, so one of the things they did is they set up the cells of the mouse. So they made HEL, which is a triangle here, bound to the membrane of the cell. So you might have a cell that looks like this, where it has Lots of HEL molecules on its surface. They also set up a version where the mouse secreted the HEL. So the HEL was not on the surface of the cell. So there's membrane bound HEL and then there's what they call soluble HEL. What we know now is that with the membrane bound HEL, it's giving the B cell a particularly strong signal. Because you can imagine those HEL molecules are so close together, they can probably bind multiple B cell receptors at the same time. Here, this is like secreted protein. It's just floating randomly around the body of the mouse. A B cell might not find two of it at the same time. So the B cell is probably getting a weaker signal. And when they did that experiment and looked at soluble HEL, this is what they saw. So let's first look at this, and then I'm going to give you one other piece of information, and then we can talk about what's going on here, because I'm realizing there's one piece of information I, I have not yet given you that's kind of important. But what, what do you just see from these flow cytometry plots? In this mouse. The sol so this mouse, 100% of its B cells respond to this self-antigen, soluble HEL. What happened? as far as you can tell here. Does this mouse have any non-B cells? Yes, we got non-B cells. <laughs> Does this mouse have any B cells? Yes, we have B cells. We have a population over here to the right. Do those B cells bind to the antigen? Yeah, they do. Maybe a little less but they, they bind the antigen. The, little, the less I probably didn't even need to, mess, to mention here, but it may be a little less. But really, they still bind the antigen. They're still present and binding the antigen. What? So there's one thing I need to tell you about this mouse. Because you might hear about this and be like, oh, that poor mouse. That poor mouse has terrible autoimmune disease. No, mouse is fine. Mouse has no autoimmune disease. Totally good. Happy little mouse running around doing mouse things. And this actually led to our understanding of this third thing that can happen to these cells. What, I was gonna say, what I'm going to say is a little, I mean, it's not like insulting, insulting, but we all understand this phenomenon. What happens with these B cells, and what we realize when we do this experiment, is that this Experiment is looking at whether or not, as I said earlier, the B cells are present. This experiment does not tell us if the B cells can function, if they can do anything. 
Have you ever been in a situation where you have been present, but not able to do anything? <laughs> you have been present, but not really engaged. <laughs> we all have. <laughs> and so this is showing us, yeah, the B cells are there, but what came up after further experimentation is that those B cells no longer have the ability to function. And they are what we refer to as anergic, or they, ha they have undergone energy. This means that they are basically permanently turned off. These B cells, before they leave, are allowed to leave the bone marrow, they're given a signal that says you're never allowed to do anything again. You're pres you can be present, but you're not allowed to function anymore. Um, and so that, and so we usually say that that means they are ener or that's that they are energized. They have undergone energy to have this happen. Um, and so here you can see the same thing from your textbook. We might have that B cell binding to a self antigen. That B cell will be signaled to become unresponsive. And you can see it goes to peripheral circulation and is unresponsive. And so it just does not respond at all. Um, sometimes people will have questions about this because they will say, this sounds really dumb. Why keep the B cell? Why not, like, just kill it? Why, why keep it? And the actual answer is that when I say this B cell is off, because it's off because it's, like, pretty dangerous, right? Like, it's off because it could lead to autoimmunity. It's off except for in super emergency situations. There are some super emergency situations where it gets turned back on. You could imagine a situation where there is a super emergency, so much cytokine, so much inflammation, everything's going wrong, where you're like, fine, turn it on. Maybe it can help. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty risky, but we're already in such a bad situation that like, we're going to die anyway, so turn on the risky ones. <laughs> That's really what's happening with the energy, is we are saving it as like a potential last-ditch effort if things go wrong. One of the reasons why I think that's important to mention is that um, one possibility, and this is not really well understood, one of those situations that's like super emergency, where you might turn on those cells, might be in a really bad infectious disease situation. Like, I don't know if you say you've had COVID really bad. You might just have so many cytokines, you turn on everything. And then after you get better, sometimes you're like, man, now I have autoimmunity. I don't know why. And in fact, there are some people who are showing up with long COVID autoimmune type symptoms. And it may be because some of their energized B cells got turned on in the super emergency time. And now we, we, you lived, you lived through the COVID. But now you may have proceeded to an autoimmune type of situation. Yep. Would you get turned back on? Um, maybe. And that's honestly about as well as we know the answer to that. So um, at this point, our B cell is going to leave the bone marrow and go into the periphery, secondary lymphoid organs, where it's going to look for antigen and do stuff. That stuff includes class switching. That stuff includes make lots of antibodies, all that good stuff. The one thing I have to tell you about all, but, but it doesn't include RAG. No RAG. <laughs> and so now the, the B cell goes into the pink parts of its life. This is the key thing I wanted to say. When the B, all the cool things the B cell does in the pink parts of its life involve the B cell interacting with the T cell. So I actually can't tell you anything more about the B cell's life until I tell you about T cells, which is why on Friday we start our discussion of MHC and T cells. On, so Friday is our beginning of MHC and T cells. It will not be covered on the exam. I, the exam is done as of what we're talking about right now. That said, Friday's lecture is one of my favorites. It has some of the best fun facts of the entire semester. Sometimes I feel sad when like no one pays attention because it's not on the exam. So please know it's a really good one. So you should please pay attention. 
Um, remember your problems on Friday and I will see you guys then. <laughs> <laughs>